And that was Nietzsche's claim, right? He said, you take the core metaphysical presupposition out from underneath Western civilization, or any civilization for that matter, and the whole thing loosens, shakens, shakes, and crumbles. Well, for Nietzsche, the metaphysical presupposition was God. Well, and then the question, of course, well, what even does that mean? And it, on one hand, it means, I suppose, adherence to a dogmatic set of beliefs. But then you might ask yourself, well, is there something else that it means? It means at least the hypothesis of some transcendent value. It means at least that. So, you know, Nietzsche announced the death of God. And so one of the consequences of that, Dostoevsky was working on exactly the same set of ideas. And in Crime and Punishment in particular, which is a book, like it's a necessary book. That's the thing. Is it, there's a number of books that were written in the last 120 years that you really have to read. And Crime and Punishment is one of them. And I think the Gulag Archipelago is another. And probably Beyond Good and Evil is another. But, you know, Dostoevsky and Nietzsche were writing in parallel. It's remarkable how much they're... they're lives intertwined, and Nietzsche knew more about Dostoevsky than, than is generally known. There's been some recent scholarship indicating that, but in Dostoevsky's book, Crime and Punishment, he has a, his main character, uh, Raskolnikov, decides that he's going to commit a murder, and he has very good justification for the murder, and Dostoevsky's very good at this. He, he puts his characters into very, very difficult moral situations, and gives them full justification for pursuing the the uh, for s pursuing the pathway that they're pursuing. And so Raskolnikov, he's broke and starving. He wants to go to law school. His sister's about to prostitute herself, rough, roughly speaking, by marrying a guy that, that hates her, that she hates, and that and he has contempt for her, at least acts in that manner. He's trying to rescue his mother as well, who's also in dire financial straits. He, he, he goes to a pawnbroker to pawn his meager position so that he can continue to scrape by, and she has this niece, I believe it's her niece, that's not very bright, who she basically treats as, an, as a slave and is horrible to. And, and so the, 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 the pawnbroker has this money. Raskolnikov is in dire need. He thinks, Look, I'll just kill her, because why the hell not? I'll take her money. She's not doing any good with it anyways. I'll free her niece, who's just lurking as a slave. She's got all these other people tangled up in her pawnbroker schemes. All that'll happen is the world will be a better place. And the only thing that's holding me back is conventional moral cowardice. And, you know, Dostoevsky has his character in Crime and Punishment go through Days, hours, hours and days and weeks of intense imagination about this, rationalization about this, trying to justify himself, placing him outside, placing himself outside the law so that he can perpetrate this act, and telling himself with all the best nihilistic arguments that the only possible thing that could be holding him back is an, an arbitrary sense of indoctrinated morality. And so Dostoevsky explores that. He does commit the murder, and then, of course, all hell breaks loose because things don't necessarily turn out the way that you want. He gets away with it, however. Well, he gets away with it technically because no one knows he did it. But he doesn't get away with it in relationship to his own conscience. And so that the rest of the book explores that. Well, Dostoevsky, I believe it was in Crime and Punishment, although he makes the same point in many of his books, he makes a very fundamental point, and this is the kind of point that that I think that people who haven't investigated these matters down this particularly lit particular literary and philosophical pathway never grapple with. Dostoevsky said straightforwardly, if there's no God, so if there's no higher value, let's say, if there's no transcendent value, then you can do whatever you want. And that's the th question that he's investigating. And you see, this is why I have such frustration, say, with people like Sam Harris, the sort of radical atheists, because they seem to think that once human beings abandon their, their grounding in the transcendent, that the, the plausible way forward is with a kind of purest rationality that automatically attributes to other people equivalent value. It's like, I just don't understand that. They, they, they believe that that's the rational pathway. What the hell is irrational about me getting exactly what I want from every one of you whenever I want it at every possible second? Why is that uh, irrational? 
And how possibly is that more irrational than us cooperating so we can both have a good time of it? I don't understand that. I mean, it's as if the, the psychopathic tendency is irrational. There's nothing irrational about it. It's pure naked self-interest. How is that irrational? I don't understand that. Where, where's the pathway from rationality to, to an egalitarian virtue? Why the hell not every man for himself and the devil take the hindmost? It's a perfectly coherent philosophy. And it's actually one that you can institute in the world with a fair bit of material success if you want to do it. So, I don't... Un see, to me, I think that, that the universe that people like Dawkins and Harris inhabit is so intensely conditioned by mythological presuppositions that they take for granted the, the ethic that emerges out of that as if it's just a given, a rational given. And this, of course, precisely do, not Nietzsche's observation as well as Dostoevsky's. That's Nietzsche's observation. You don't get it. The ethic that you think is normative is a consequence of its, of, its, of its nesting inside this tremendously lengthy history, much of which was expressed in mythological formulation. You wipe that out. You don't get to keep all the presuppositions and just assume that they're rationally axiomatic. They're, the rational, to make a rational argument, you have to start with an in initial proposition. Well, the proposition that underlies Western culture is that there's a transcendent morality. Now, you could say that's a transcendent morality instantiated in the figure of God. That's fine. You could even call that a personification of the morality. If you, if you, wanna, if you, if you don't want to move into a metaphysical space, I'm not arguing for the existence of God. I'm arguing that the ethic that drives our culture is predicated on the idea of God and that you can't just take that idea away and expect the thing to remain intact mid-air without any foundational support. Now, you don't have to buy that, but if you're interested in the idea, then you can read Nietzsche because that's what he was trying to sort out. And it wasn't only Nietzsche who came to that conclusion. It was many people have come to that conclusion, but I think the two who've outlined it most spectacularly were Nietzsche and Dostoevsky. And Nietzsche is an unbelievably um, influential philosopher. You know, I don't think there was anyone that was more influential during the entire course of the 20th century, excepting a very, very tiny handful of other people, excepting the scientists. We won't bother with their, with their discussion. You could put Marx in that category. You could put Freud in that category, partly. But after that, the list starts to get a lot thinner, you know, so maybe there's 10 people up in that level. And Dostoevsky, of course, I think, I mean, if, if you ever, if anybody ever prepares a list of the top 10 greatest literary figures in the world, he would be in the top 10 list. You know, I think he's perhaps second to Shakespeare and maybe above Shakespeare in my estimation. So these aren't trivial people we're talking about. And they weren't dealing with trivial issues. Well, so then the question might be, what's at the bottom of the idea of a transcendent value? And I wanted, wanted to approach that staying out of the metaphysical domain as much as possible, because you can claim anything you want from a metaphysical perspective, and that's a big problem. And so people will say, well, why come up with the hypothesis of God, for example? God could be anything. There's a satire, uh, uh, the flying spaghetti monster, right, is a classic satirical representation of a deity that the atheist types use to buttress their arguments. And fair enough, you know, as a satirical idea, it's pretty damn funny. But there's things about this that aren't the least bit amusing. And the thing that's not amusing is, well, what, if anything, is our culture predicated on? Okay, so what happened? Well, Nietzsche and Dostoevsky put this forth this set of propositions. And out of Dostoevsky's line of thinking, to some degree, grew Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn documented the absolute horrors of equity predicated Soviet society, you know, and we don't teach, we don't learn about that, right? Uh, this I don't understand, is that what happened in the 20th century on the radical left end of the spectrum is not well documented. Students don't learn about it. Why the hell is that? We learn about World War II, we learn about what happened in the Holocaust, and fair enough, we absolutely should. But nobody knows. It's a mystery to everyone when, when I talk about what happened in the Soviet Union, and that's absolutely appalling. And that's to say nothing about what happened in China, which was equally horrible.
The system didn't work. It was predicated on the wrong values. Unless you think that that sort of thing means worked. You know, because you, you have to define that as well. But it collapsed under its own weight after it killed tens of millions of people. That doesn't really, and still, it's not like Russia has recovered. It doesn't seem to me like that's a very good definition of worked. Now, whatever we're doing in the West seems to work for all of its flaws. And the question is, are we just deceiving ourselves? Is it just arbitrary power politics and opinion? Or is there something at the bottom of it? So when Solzhenitsyn wrote the Gulag Archipelago, he believed that the Russians would have to return to Orthodox Christianity to find their pathway forward. And that, of course, has made him into a reactionary in the eyes of many of his critics. But that is perhaps what is happening in Russia, although it's very difficult to tell because Putin also seems to be using his affiliation with the Orthodox Christian Church as, as a means to consolidate power. So the situation in Russia is unclear, but a religious revival, if that's happening in Russia, and perhaps it isn't, but if it is happening, is something that unfolds over decades and even centuries. So it's not an easy thing to evaluate when it first starts to happen.